Welcome to Deep Dive Film School. I'm Adam Sherlock. And I'm Adam Poulter. If you like what you see slash hear, please like and subscribe. You can find us in all the spaces and places that people what? Find good media. That's right. Follow us anywhere you listen to podcasts. YouTube is a huge uh, platform for us as well as TikTok and Instagram. All right. Let's get into our third installment of our Yasujiro Ozu Festival. Mm. Uh, this is late spring, yep. 1949. Um, kind of interesting... I, I kind of feel this is like the prequel to early summer. Well, I didn't. I mean, it's it's. It it's, makes sense if you think of the. It's the a seasons. Noriko trilogy, which is kind of amazing. Like it, between it this and then Tokyo Story, which again, this is what love so the cool about these. Too, so I'm glad. I totally agree. Well, and I think that it's one of these things where it's like, as you like when we were talking about, like I didn't know that there was a sequel to uh, In the Mood for Love. It's, true. it's that same yeah, kind of a thing where it's like yeah. you might have a sense of a director, but you really don't know until you start to dive in. And we have uh, between uh, early summer and then this movie, late spring, which came first, and then Tokyo Story, three vastly different versions of a girl with the same name played by the same actress. Different last names, though, in all the movies. And different families, too, right? Yes, and like there's, you know... I think at this point we kind of know the actors he likes. He uses a lot of the same actors as a lot of directors do. They mm -hmm. have the people they're comfortable with and want to use over and over and stuff like that. So um, that's always fun. You know, think of Joe Dante or someone like that. Well, like, like we, we did a whole episode that was around like actor troops that, yeah. that work with directors. And like if we would have known. Be, this could be one. Oh, yeah, it would have sure. been on the list. <laughs> for sure. But she's my favorite of all of them. So it was really I'm. And she's not necessarily the central story in all of them. She is in this one mm -hmm. um, and, and uh, everything. So uh, kind of interesting, though. But I, I like I w kept checking. I'm like, OK, so no, this is different because that actor was her dad in that movie. And this actor, this act, he was the uncle in the other. Yeah. Movie. And the brother in this one. And, <laughs> yeah. And, I mean, well, and that guy, the guy who plays her father in this one, that plays her brother in early summer and then plays the grandpa, her it, father, or, yeah. you know, uh, the father in law and the other one. And I'm like. The, this whole span is less than 10 years. Like, that's some makeup on that dude. Yeah, really acting interesting. Prowess, like, really interesting. Sure. Um, but a lot of the same themes as early summer. Marriage. Um, marriage, yeah, forced marriage. Family. Family, you know, the world is changing. A lot of the Ozu things that we came to see. So it honestly is a lot like a, a prequel. She is 27 here, I think, something like that. Mm -hmm. And I think she was in her mid-30s in early summer. Um, so a little bit younger, but still people... Even back then, we're pressuring her to uh, to get married. And this is just kind of a different journey of getting there um, than the other one. Based on a book called Father and Daughter, you know, you had... I the, the father and daughter story is kind of the main heart of this movie. Totally. And uh, I love that part. Uh, you know, I'm kind of, I'm almost used to the beautiful cinematography at this point. You know, he does so much interesting stuff. We do have some more moving shots. <clears throat> you know, Floating Weeds almost is becoming more of a, a, a isolated movie yeah. as far as camera movement goes then you know we in these other movies we have seen a little bit more we have like a movie train shot in this one you know and a few other things but you know cinematography is such a big thing for can him. i talk about one of my favorites of that that i thought was like it actually made me laugh out loud because ozu is known for these pillow shots these static shots that allow you to kind of meditate on a, on a thought or a theme mm -hmm. and uh here, he does one of those with Noriko riding a bike. And when you Love think it. about the technical acrobatics of that period of time to make it feel I, like I totally a static of, shot. I totally thought of that. Because we're with her and she, as she's moving through a frame. So there is still, when we're watching her, no but movement. But she's obviously on a stationary bike. <laughs> but she's not. She's not. Oh, No. No. I went down a whole rabbit hole oh, reading about how they did this. <laughs> they they had to get it timed just right so that she stays in place while everything else is moving so that it still is one of his static shots. Yeah. Even <laughs> though they're like in the truck bed of a car, you know, of a truck uh -huh. and they're moving and she's having to bicycle in this hole. And, and apparently a lot of actors who really liked so working with... So they've got the moving background and turning it. Yeah. But it's actually happening. She's she, They're driving down a road and she's riding a bike and they're having to like, they had to do it over and over and huh. over again to get the meter and timing and the speed just right <clears throat> so that she still seemed like a static of her <clears throat> on this bike. That definitely was a different shot than I had seen in any other Ozu movie. Well, I, as I started to do more research, and this is obviously we'll get more into the meat of the, the heart of the story, as you were saying, but just from a technical aspect, one of the other things as I was reading about this, 
um, that absolutely blew my mind is uh, according to there is a, a book uh, that I, I didn't read the whole thing, but I was reading a bunch of passages from this guy, Donald Ritchie, uh, who's done a lot of, of uh, research and written a lot about both Ozu and Kurosawa, um, talked about how Ozu would block out all of his scenes and based upon, wrap your brain around this one, the amount of steps that he wanted an actor in a certain way in which they were moving. So a certain speed, right? That slow, deliberate pacing, how long it would take an actor to enter scene in the far distance and then make it to center stage that he could see with that 50 millimeter lens, which mm -hmm. is the closest to the human eye that he used for everything. Sure. That's how they would build the sets. So he would, <laughs> he would be like, this took, you know, uh, 10 seconds to move across these eight feet to get to center depth. So now we can build the set for this house around that. <clears throat> so that's the level at which, I mean, people think that Wes Anderson's a psycho when it comes to his building of these crazy little set pieces, but like can't hold a candle to what <clears throat> this guy was doing where he's literally like saying, no, I want it slower. So that means that the room has to be it's kind deeper. of similar to <laughs> Bong Joon-ho and Parasite and the house. Mm -hmm. that exactly. Around yeah. Everything. But it's just a Very crazy thought. And, and I think some people, some actors really enjoyed that meticulousness that Ozu used. And other uh, actors were like, oh, yeah, you I got... had an amazing time, but it was so hard. Right. Cause... For sure. I, it's, I, it's like working with Fincher. Right. Like you know, or Kubrick or someone like that. You know, you're like, you know, you have to know what you're getting into. And do you have the personality type to deal with this? Yeah. And understand the art artistic reasons for it. So, well, and knowing that Ozu is the kind of director <laughs> where he, uh, a note he might give an actor is like, you don't care that much and go again. Right. <laughs> and that that's all they need to take that and yeah. then have it work. But that's solid directing. Right it really there. is. But yeah. it's, but it's amazing to think that it was that meticulous in terms of that, that it wasn't, Again, to think about somebody like uh, who leans into happy accidents like a Herzog, mm -hmm. this is the opposite of that, where sure. it's like it's meticulous to the degree that uh, each one of these shots is so thought of ahead of time where everything has been staged already before they even show up with the actors. Um, Amazing. Which is a, a, a leads lends itself to why these movies are so incredible. I'm, I'm so glad you looked into that. And, uh, you know, like I, we, we should, you know, a lot of times I like to just look at a movie as a movie and not necessarily think of the outside reasons. And thank you for doing the research to kind of understand how he's doing this a little more because um, I was, I, I, I appreciate that because it is unique and the things you don't quite know what you're looking at sometimes. And, um, to see that it's built around one shot and it's a static shot. Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. It's totally crazy. And you're just like, Hey, you enter through the back and then this is where all this. So they're just happens. on a big stage then. Yeah, pretty mm -hmm. much. I mean, all of these are very, uh, crafted and created sure, I mean, to you get can, that feel outside of like the B roll shots of going to Tokyo and stuff like yeah. that. You yeah. know, like I think we are, <clears throat> Um, all this interior stuff, which is most of it, they rarely go outside um, in these movies. And when they do, it is that B-roll kind of stuff where mm -hmm. they're actually at some place. It's rarely on the set outside. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <clears throat> well, and I think that like, you know, to, to, to talk about the actual sort of like what Ozu was trying to say with this movie, because when we did early summer, I remember you saying, you know, like Noriko is just such a happy person. Mm -hmm. And this Noriko is not. This Noriko a little different, yeah. is, she still smiles a lot, but man, the actress um, uh, uh, Setsuko Hara yes. is so brilliant at even just that nuance of the other version of her is a legitimately happy person. And this is a woman who knows that she's supposed to smile. So even when she's talking to her father's friend and and deep down she is disgusted that he got remarried she yeah, thinks he's she's dirty filthy he's filthy right <laughs> yeah but she's still smiling and being playful but you're looking in her eyes and you're like the smile isn't reaching her eyes like she is like kind of i don't want to say a prude but but is like don't do that like you don't you know like why couldn't you just be happy with your life the way that it is but that smile is plastered on her face and it's such a jarring contrast from who we met in the last movie because they are such different characters. I didn't think it was that jarring. I don't think like, but there is a lot more emotion to her in this movie. No doubt, you know, especially near the end of the movie um, where she really breaks down and really is connected to her father. Right. And, and really like, you know, this whole 
predeposition of are you getting married? When are you getting married? We find out that she um, actually had uh, got hurt during the war. So she had some medical issues or had some kind of health problems. They mm-hmm. don't really clarify. But that was, I'm assuming, the excuse to not get married for yeah. a long time. Not that she really cares about it, but again, you get these nosy ass fucking people that just pry and pry and pry and like, what are you doing? And I'm sure it's a cultural thing and a certain expectation of whatever, you know, uh, every culture has that, I guess, to some degree. So it's interesting to see that, though, especially as an American, you know, and just and and, uh, you know, just kind of how they view family um, and how the you know, the the uh, what it what it means to be. You know, these people, very meager means, right? For yeah. the most part. Mm-hmm. Like, they're not in some fancy houses or anything like that. This is your basic livable means. They sleep on the floor. Yeah, working class people. Exactly, yeah. you know? And so, like, you know, they, they're just happy to be alive and that everyone's healthy and, and whatever. So, anyways, it's kind of interesting to, to go there. Well, and they're, and, they're, and they're happy together. And I think to your point of, like, why can't people just leave them alone? There is this sense that, like, both both father and daughter are boxed into this expectation <clears throat> that that she is going to that she's going to leave the nest and, well, and, and even though I, they're both happy like they don't neither one of them wants this right and the father ends up having to lie and make up this no story. mom like i think we need to, that needs to be clear that there's no mother figure here mm-hmm. in this whole movie yeah it's just she's, the two she's of them. died and or something happened to her but mm-hmm. at a younger age I yeah think. and that you know they're happy with their situation until uh, uh, dad's sister starts getting Start involved asking and starts questions. asking questions. Mm-hmm. And then he feels guilty. And you to to see it go to its end, we're at the end of it. She is married off, right? Like, and that that is the eventual Yeah, we ending. see her in her wedding dress and, you know. And, and just miserable, doesn't want to do it the whole time, you know. And and dad also is like, I did the right thing and he's miserable. I mean. Well, and I, just, want, uh, I wonder too, you know, I guess we're kind of jumping to the end a little bit here. But I, I wonder just what his motives actually are. You know, like I, I there's a certain like rep you have to keep right i think um in their lives you know these aren't uh you know like you said working class people and so it's kind of interesting to um see what his actual motives are is he really planning on remarrying you know like yeah you know like he you find out later that he says like it's the biggest lie ever told right and that he did that now I, I will say that there are so many interesting, interesting things because happening here. Because she's supposed here. to do the right thing. Right. right. Yeah. Well, there's so many interesting things happening here. And I know that I said that she was maybe kind of a prude or at least just not. Tra- What's funny is she's super non-traditional about wanting to get married, but she's very traditional about the idea of somebody remarrying or these kinds of things. And, you know, she's one of the most uh, uh, desireless, sexless characters that we've ever encountered true Um, i hadn't really thought about that and i think what's interesting about that is uh because something happens in this movie that i think is worth noting which is that made me have to do research on this ozu shows us a play yeah he doesn't like to do that he doesn't show us it's funny i had that written down and was going to ask you like the hidden meaning behind this kabuki show all right so let's dive into it okay okay so I had to find out more about this because it's the first time Ozu has actually sat and shown us seven minutes of this movie is taken up with this play. Yeah. Right? Way more than any other movie. Yeah. So why is he bothered to show us that? Uh Well, the no theater Kabuki play is called The Water Iris. Okay? Okay. And uh, the characters in The Water Iris... Uh, uh, the, you know, he talks about the, our main uh, male character in the Kabuki play talks about um, how he remembers the color and the shape of the lively flower, but now they've grown old. They're fading away. Well, the iris is a pretty, tra- uh, from what I read, is a pretty traditional Japanese symbolism for sex and sexuality. Oh, okay. And that later in the play, the iris actually shows up as like a woman. And the two of them, again, through dance and through uh, uh, music and through song, are essentially consummating some kind of a relationship. So for its time and place, it was a pretty damn sexy play. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So it's very much about sexuality. It's very much about youth. It's very much about vitality. And it's very much about sex, right? Huh. And he's there with his daughter watching this. And then he, during that play, 
waves to a woman Mm -hmm. and you, we get to sit on Noriko's face as she goes through the whole realization (laughs) of everything. Yeah. And I think that the, the fact they're at that play and that's still the chanting and music that's happening is just drilling it into her brain even more that like dad is going to find somebody new dad is going to, and it's going to, and it's not going to be some celibate relationship. He's probably going to have sex with this woman. She needs to accept it. I think it's all the parts and even though she thinks it's filthy. Yep. Which is really interesting because like her, you know, she's very forward thinking with not wanting to get married, but why aren't you forward thinking about them, him wanting to get married? And And I don't know if so. you're like, you're kind of condescending a little bit. Right. You're contradicting yourself. And and I wonder, and I, but there's another part of me that's like, again, for a lot of people who maybe couldn't live the authentic lives they wanted to, as we were talking about, Oh, you know, the, the, uh, that, the reflection that Ozu may have been gay and also never married and also never started a family and lived with his mother until she mm-hmm. passed away in, in a, in a, you know, a celibate lifestyle. I think during that period of time, is that part of who this Noriko is also is that she knows she has to do the right thing and get married to some guy, but there's this other side of her where she's like, you know, to choose to be asexual for that time period was the other option, right? You either were living in secret or you were asexual. So it could also be that. And we questioned this in early summer. Yep. Um, as well, you yeah. know, like is the reason she doesn't want to get married or is because those traditions don't fit with what she actually but desires. I, but I got to say this water iris, uh, scene, this seven minute scene to me, that's late summer's version of the, the rain in the street scene sure, sure. from, from floating weeds where I was just like, it was spellbinding to me to watch Hara as well, an actress just lyrics. break down like that while the lyrics are going. And we get this, uh, digestive, uh, non-digestive music that's just happening in the moment. I was like, this, this is just... Without the character saying a word. Brilliant. Yeah. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. Just give me chills. I mean, it reminded me of something with that chanting and the music happening and watching her break. It felt like something from a Bergman film. Like, it was that level of just, like, wow. brilliance. Like, I really was was so deeply impressed. Awesome. Well, yeah, doing the research, too, again, um, I knew you were going to have the answer to this one. That's why I just wrote it as a question. Cause I know, why did we I, see the whole play? I know, I know, I know your brain. <laughs> also, it's just something different we hadn't seen. And, you know, the er, early summers, all, I, I'm sorry, Floating Weeds is all about an uh, acting troupe who does kabuki shows, but yeah. they never show a show. Yeah. They and, even talk about how one of them did a bad job acting. And I'm like, I would have loved to have seen that, but I know yeah. Ozu's doing it on purpose, right? Yeah. Well, maybe not. Yeah. Who knows? I, I, who knows? Yeah. Anyway, so very, very interesting. Um, the fact that these two characters are boxed in in this way and that the pressure keeps building and building is so heartbreaking for our two leads because we would just wish that they would be able to be left alone to or, be these people that they're happy in the situation that they're in and that there's nothing wrong with that yeah there's also something to say about moving on and like you know like having a life of your own and and i think ozu's forward thinking enough to have the characters especially the parental characters understand that yes but I also think if there's one thing that we can learn from the Noriko trilogy is that Ozu thinks, at, in particular for women, which I think he was correct about at this time period, that to marry is to lose one's own identity, right? That that both yeah. Norikos that we've seen so far identify themselves with their role in their family and that society in both cases is pushing them to do something different, which basically at that time and place meant adopt your husband's life yeah, and be gone from this. This is gone now for you. And she's you. fine. She's an independent woman. She has a job, yeah. everything, you know, she's doing anything. Yeah. There's a, there's a quote. One of the characters says, I believe it's the father. He says, happiness is something we wait around for. Don't expect happiness in the first years of marriage, basically, Dude, is what he's kind of saying. That whole talk that he gives, I'm like, that's the worst way to it try really and give was. a pep talk. Yeah, where you're he's not like, talking anyone into anything he here. He tells this whole story about how, how her mom was, like, crying in the kitchen. And he's like, it'll be okay. You know, and I'm like, this is horrible. Like, what a horrible way to give your daughter a pep talk. Now, uh, there is a moment where she kind of gives in. And yeah. she's like, okay, fine. Again, it's very telling that pitching these guys to her. Oh, I got to tell them. Yep. I got to tell them by tonight. They're waiting. We never meet 
the fiance. I, I, I was going to say that next. Yeah, I, I love that. Very in, in the mood for love, yeah. right? Not important. Yeah, Doesn't no, it's not part here. of the story, really, because yep. it's about their family. It's not about her new life. It's about the life we're watching. Yep. Um, so, yeah, no, absolutely. It, there is a moment close towards the end here where uh, they go and have what's going to be one of the last sort of days together before the wedding and it's just father yeah. and daughter this little trip they take and this, they take this little trip and it's adorable yeah. and that night they are uh in this rented room and they're both sleeping on the floor and she's smiling again and and it feels more of a legitimate smile in a way and she's talking to her father until finally he falls asleep and then she kind of sits there and it's so funny. Uh, this, is, this is one of the reasons why I love uh, doing these kinds of, of critiques is the scene cuts away with her still smiling. And she's been sitting and we just sit with her smiling, laying in bed. And it cuts away to this shot of this vase in front of this window. And we sit with that for four or five seconds. Yeah. Then we leave that and we come back to her and she's not smiling. And we get that those tears start running down her face. Right. Mm -hmm. And I, we've talked about the pillow shots. We've talked about all these things, but I was still like, Whoa, like, why didn't we stay and watch her stop smiling? Like why cut away? So <laughs> I went to the internet and I just typed in Ozu vase scene with a question mark and I'm plugging somebody. I don't know the guy. So this is just free advertising. Uh, there's a channel, this was three years ago, there's a YouTube channel called Nerd Writer One, who literally has an eight and a half minute video called Why Did Ozu Cut to a Vase? <laughs> yeah. And it's amazing. And apparently it is one of these edits that, that, that film critics have been talking about for decades. Interesting. Of what the purpose of it is. And lots of people have different ideas. And some people are like, it's supposed to be jarring so that we're left to wonder, is she really happy before he cuts back and answers it for us? Sure. Our other people are saying this is still just part of one of his pillow shots. He wants us to meditate in between, mm -hmm. although it's a hell of a scene to cut away from. Sure, sure. Right. And, but like there's 10 different opinions about what it might be. Now, here's something that I discovered. And this is me. I haven't done this in a long time. I'm putting on my Professor Bullshit hat. Oh, I love Professor Bullshit. I know. So uh, has, what happened to him? Uh, I mean, he's still around, obviously. <laughs> he's Living me, under a bridge so. somewhere. So, so there is a... There is a, a, a Japanese philosophy called mono no aware. And what it basically means is, as it easily can be translated is the pathos of things, right? That, and this happens a lot in other Japanese art, whether that be tapestry art, whether that be uh, uh, haiku uh, and poetry or things like, like this. Um, and it's basically the idea that one of the easiest ways, and this resonates so much with me because with me, I think I do this. <clears throat> one of the easiest ways to talk about a sense of time passing and a sense of things changing mm -hmm. is to look to static objects, right? To see a tree and to be like, it's there now, but a hurricane might blow it over in a couple of days, right? To see a vase and to see the trees moving out behind it and to think like, who made that vase? Like, how long has that been there? How many other people have slept in this room and we haven't had seen similar this angle of the room before? Either. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Could be anywhere. Because he does the straight on shot. Yeah. And, it's, and she's depth. looking at the ceiling, so it's not her POV, right? And, yeah, yeah. But but it's this sense of like a sense of loss, a sense of time passing, a sense of wonder, and a sense of quiet respect and sadness, just of things, right? That the pathos of things themselves can say so much more than just sitting and looking at a person's face can. And I went, God, that's me. That's how I, that's, I like, I love that. And again, it made me think you of somebody things. like, <laughs> I just look around. <laughs> but I think of somebody like Herzog, you know, who also likes to do that, where sometimes just oh, yeah, for cutting sure. to that grass with the wind through it is way deeper and more introspective and important than a person's face might be. But it's this mono no aware. And I was like, that's so fascinating. But again, I think that that's what the vase is. Now, again, that's just my perspective. But see, these are the these are the kind of cultural reasons you need to watch movies that are not from your country. Right? Yeah, and that remaking it isn't going to do a goddamn thing. Oh, absolutely. Right? Because the voice then is so different than the voice would be now. Right. 
And that's fine. And that's okay for things to evolve like that. But very, very interesting. But it does make me think, you know, the question that I kept asking before of somebody like Ang Lee, where I'm like, how did that guy tell a story about the depression and ennui of like the 1970s in America? And it's like, sure, well, sure. all he needed to know is that it's about the disillusion of the family. And then he was able to be like, so I'm just going to show this frozen tree. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and that's why it still works for all of us. Cause the, pathos of things is deep within in the, with inside of every one of us who's an artist love it wow yeah wow you love this movie i think it's phenomenal yeah and so fucking depressing it it's is very so heavy depressing yeah and you have to let oh. it soak in and think about it it's definitely all, all of his movies i'm thinking about the next day yeah you know the final thing i'll say the other moment that was another just like knocked me out of my shoes moment um, is it's this again, what should be a happy moment, but is so damn sad where Noriko is in her full traditional regalia, which again, for a forward thinking woman does feel like, Ugh, like you don't look like that. Like, look at you in this traditional garb. Like all of your modernity has been stripped away to this, sure. to this traditional look. Um, and she's crying. Like she doesn't want to go get married. And they're all there. Like, and even dad's like, no, nope, I don't have anything else to say. You know? Yeah. No, he was like, he, he was, he was quick with his pep talk. Yep. yep. His pep talk was, <laughs> was a little bit there because I think he also was like, I also don't want this to happen. <laughs> and they all talk. And then it's like, well, let's go get in the car. And so then we just see like the kids like laughing and playing outside with the cars as they go out there. And then we cut back to the dressing room <laughs> and it uh, took my breath away was the mirror she'd been getting ready in and now no one's in it. Hmm. Her identity's gone. Interesting. I, I was like, oh, it hit me like a dagger, man. I wow. was like, just that mirror. We cut back to this shot that's just the mirror and now nobody's in it. And I, it just was amazing. Amazing. He's talented. Yeah. He knows he, where to put a camera. Whew. He knows how to tell a story with like Absolutely. lots of nuance. So much nuance and just... Brilliant acting and 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 incredible direction choices and these things that the pillow shots are so much more than just an opportunity to meditate. Sometimes they are the they're the punch. What you don't say, right? Yeah, they're they are the they are the the gut punch at the at the end of what we're seeing everybody do. It's like you don't even need the actor in the final scene that's going to give you, you know, the the most important final scene in this movie is a super, super, super long peel of an apple. Yeah, the, the apple of sadness. The <laughs> apple of sadness. But it is. I, I wrote it down. She's, pe she's peeling the apple of sadness. Oh, God. And he just keeps peeling it. It just gets longer and longer. And you're like, you ain't eating that, dude. You're, <laughs> you're done. Like... It's, it's like when uh, Rooney Mara uh, eats the pie. It's the whole pie in a ghost, ghost story. story. <laughs> it totally is, though. These are the kinds of things that telegraph so much more than dialogue exactly. or something big and bombastic ever can. Well, that's the beauty of film. And, like, it, stuff, you know, I've talked about this for decades at this point. Almost decades. What are, what are we, year 16 now? Uh, it's almost plural. But, uh, but uh, you know, show, don't tell, mm -hmm. right? Like, and it's so funny because the first history of movies were all silent movies yeah. and that you had to show don't tell yeah that's the only and then once started people started talking they got lazy yeah i'm upset and <laughs> sad see <laughs> it's like, you don't have to do that let you me speak just... out my emotions it's on so... camera <laughs> it's a talkie <laughs> no i mean i really this movie really uh i was i was so uh I was so surprised and, and early summer left me or early summer left me with such like a warm, lovey feeling this one that I not. was surprised <laughs> at how cold this one left me and just sure. like, but it was just, yeah, man. Wow. It's, right. it's, 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 it's a really good movie. <laughs> yeah. I loved it. I absolutely loved it. Um, all right. Well, next week we are going to do our tops and flops of 2023, yes. a classic segment we have done every year. I yep. think of the, of our podcast, and um, so definitely tune in for that. Uh, like and subscribe, all the spaces and places, uh, Instagram, TikTok, YouTube. We're in all those places. Please uh, follow us for this journey and watch along. Bye, you guys. Thanks. Thanks.